The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, bringing you my version of the orchestration of With Pipes and Drums by Bartok. Now, if you look at the date that I uploaded this video, it is before my announcement on the 15th of July. Of course, I'm releasing it about a month later, after the deadline has closed for all of the submissions some of which I've already released for people on Patreon, and there have been, I think, one or two, if my plan is correct, one or two have also been released publicly of the website subscribers, and so on, and all of it will be released by the end of August, if my plan goes right. But I'm releasing this now because I want people to know that I had a plan from the beginning, <laughs> that however much... I might sound like another orchestrator that has submitted things, and I might sound extremely very much like one or two of our submissions, or maybe all of them, who knows, maybe we'll all orchestrate according to some of the same principles. But just letting you know where I was at uh, before the challenge started. And I think that I'm going to take this approach in future challenges to release my video first, uh, privately, <laughs> And then, to make an orchestration lesson out of my arrangement first, upload it, and then release it after the deadline. So that you know that I'm playing fair. Not that that's ever been an issue, but just to be perfectly kosher about it. Now let's talk a little bit about the Out of Doors Piano Suite. I was first introduced to this music by my father, who, in the late 70s, mid 70s, was the dramaturg for a series of German plays that were being produced in San Francisco at a small theater called the Epic West. And the Epic West was on Potrero Hill, a fairly small non-equity theater, basically a place that has 99 seats or less. If you go up to 100 seats, then you have to pay the actors what's called equity. It's sort of like union scale, uh, and not all little theaters can really afford that unless they have a real huge runaway production, and that's almost never. But Epic West did pretty well, and they were interested in translating and presenting in the United States for the first time the works of Boto Strauss, who is a German playwright at that time in West Germany and very influenced in a way by Dario Fo and um, some of the other socialist uh, playwrights who kind of had a little bit of an origin in Bertolt Brecht and perhaps a little bit also with George Bernard Shaw and so on. And my father translated two plays of Strauss one of which was the hypochondriacs, and they used the music of the out-of-doors piano suite for that play. And it's an extremely claustrophobic murder mystery kind of a play, and it's somewhat surrealist and um, has, has very interesting internal dramas going on with everybody at all times. I wish that there had been a film of it, and it was available on YouTube for everybody to watch, because I really felt that the play is a masterpiece, and that the use of this piano music was also masterful, and I think that that is my father's doing, is that not only did he translate the play and make it contemporary in its language for the 1970s, but he also suggested the music, and he did a few other things too, but it, it ended up making the play really, really relevant for the times. If only my father had followed that career as a dramaturg, I think he could have been great. But 
The only thing that I can do to carry on his possible legacy is to introduce this piece to you, which a lot of people have not heard of. One of the things that I was told by several people who I have previewed this with is that once they heard the piano version of it, they could immediately imagine what the orchestration would be like. And thankfully, they've all kept the secret and have not revealed which piece it is, because I think that if there was even the hint of this terrific dynamic music that people would just jump on the bandwagon and already start submitting orchestrations to the challenge even before I've announced it, if if there was any kind of word. So I have been sitting on this for over a year on the idea of using this as a challenge. And I apologize for a bit of calculation of working around the copyright restrictions of making most or all of the American submissions into private lessons. I'm, I'm really sorry about that, but that is just the nature of the beast. I want to respect the publishing company in the United States by not making this like a big free giveaway of Bartok's resources, but at the same time, making use of the fair use doctrine and educating people about it. And who knows, maybe that will actually help the publisher to sell more copies of the piano version, which I actually bought a long time ago myself, and you know, hopefully more people will buy because it really is terrific to play, it's terrific to listen to, and it's just a great piece of music. And to orchestrate was just incredible. So, we are going to have a listen to this, and then I'm going to pick apart why I made the decisions that I did. But first, let's look at the orchestra that I ended up using. Now, if you'll remember my guidelines, I had a restriction, and that was that I didn't want like eight timpani or 16 timpani. I wanted people to orchestrate this using Bartok's orchestra for the concerto for orchestra. Now, this piece was actually written in 1926, and the concerto for orchestra was written in 1945. So there is a bit of a difference there in terms of Bartok's evolving approach, but I feel that it's consistent. It's only about 20 years, but... You know, but Bartok really changed over that time and really progressed and developed towards incredible mastery. So I would like to think, you know, what would Bartok do if he had been commissioned to orchestrate his own work right at the end of his life? So that's that's what I've kept in mind as my approach. And he would be limited to the resources that he would have had in 1945. So in this case... I have also played fair. We've got triple wins, and all the auxiliaries are the standard auxiliaries. Piccolo for the two flutes, English horn for the two oboes, bass clarinet for the two clarinets, and contrabassoon added to the two bassoons. So, you know, I haven't gone ahead and had two contrabassoons, two bass clarinets, um, two bass trombones. Now, of course, that is kosher in terms of the guidelines of the challenge. I have no idea what people are going to be submitting at this point in the timeline. They might choose to have more weighty auxiliaries added on, and then the standard instruments backed off a little bit in terms of availability. That's all fine. The only thing that I did that was out of the ordinary for me was scoring this bass trumpet part. And that's actually cool because throughout my entire career of uh, the hundreds of works that I have orchestrated professionally, I have never yet had the occasion to score for bass trumpet. I mean, I know how to score for it, and it's a really great instrument, and I've studied it, and I have actually had some of my works played for bass trumpet after I wrote them for trombone. In the case that I'm thinking of, it was an arrangement of Harlem Nocturne for a trombone ensemble here in Australasia. 
And the trombone ensemble said, hey, uh, we don't mind a few E-flats in this, a few high E-flats if you want to. And I said, okay, that's fine. I normally wouldn't score that high. But seeing as how the original piece was in C minor, uh, they were assuming that that note would come up a few times, and it was okay to do it. So I went ahead and scored Harlem Nocturne for trombone quartet. And then the uh, first trombonist came back to me and said, hey, man, that was like, <laughs> those were some pretty high E flats. So I said, well, I only put in like three or four. He was like, yeah, well, I shouldn't have told you to do it. <laughs> but the upshot of it was that in the performance, he ended up playing them on bass trumpet. So all was saved, but I really would have liked to have seen it on trombone. And I think that in a later performance, like the premiere, he did bass trumpet. But in a later performance, when he had got his lip up to a lot of really high playing because of some other contemporary arrangements or some other kind of stuff, he ended up doing this as well on just a standard tenor trombone. It's easily reachable if you have a good lip to play E flat on a trombone, but it's just like it can wear you out. And it can be tiring to the lip and sort of mess you up for the next piece. A lot of people don't understand this with brass instruments. Just because something is possible and playable by some performers doesn't mean that everybody wants to do it, right? Because you can end up really messing up somebody's embouchure. It's better to play it safe unless a player asks you to do something that is really way out of range, right? Okay, so... The rest of the brass are all pretty standard for horns and F, two trumpets in C, two trombones, bass trombone, and tuba. Of course, you'll see a lot of low scoring for the low auxiliaries in brass and winds. But the point is that I was able to get the arrangement that I did without having to add on extras. Right Now, if you needed a few extra auxiliaries and sort of fit them into the orchestra size of Concerto for Orchestra, then that's totally fine. And I'm not saying that my version is better or anything, but the point is that it is playable with a standard orchestra. So, you know, there nobody needs to hire an extra contrabassoonist or anything like that. And bass trumpet in E-flat is a really common auxiliary to add. Now, <laughs> for our percussion, my limit was timpani of four kettles, and also just three percussionists. And you notice that I've got a side drum or snare drum, tenor drum, bass drum, cymbals, tam-tam, and tubular bells. And I actually only have one tam-tam note in this entire piece. <laughs> and I don't overuse bass drum, although I do use it to a specific effect, right? A bass drum can just really get tiring, and there were a couple of sketches that I made of this where the bass drum part just went on and on, and I just thought, oh, that is just too much. And so it has been trimmed way down. And then just standard complement of strings. So the stage is set. I've explained the origins of my interest in this piece and a few little extra things about the players. So let's have a listen now. And then I'll have my specific comments and take this piece apart when we're done.
So as you could hear there, this arrangement really stretches the possibilities of note performer and the whole Sibelius playback framework. So isn't that strange how, even though I indicated a niente, the uh, dynamics flared right there at the end. I, I don't know why Sibelius does that, but it does that. And also, you probably noticed that there were a lot of moments where the balance was a little off, and I would like to think that that is the playback's fault, not mine. There's certain imprecisions built into um, the way that the playback works for Note Performer and for Sibelius in general, just because of the nature of the beast, right? There's a kind of a lowest common denominator approach. You have to be able to develop your playback in a way for a notation software app like this so that it catches the most kinds of arrangements. And I, I won't get into all of it, but yeah, that you can see that there are a couple of problems. But as far as my inner ear is concerned, and my personal experience as an orchestrator, I think I got pretty much everything right in terms of balance and so on. So you probably noticed back here, I'm just going to tug this, Poco Stringendo will accelerate the score a little bit just because of the way that the playback recognizes that term. Okay, and that is what happens in the score anyhow when people perform this. But there is a tendency from some pianists to start to push the tempo from right around here. And just like in the orchestration challenge of last year, I have interpreted that to be something that should be in this score as well. So Poco Accelerando, I just put that, um, pushing the tempo up to 144. And I, th I think that that works really, really good. It gives it a lot of energy right in here that I, I feel this reminds me the most of Bartok, this section right in here. Now, let's go back to the beginning. Okay, so you heard that I had a sort of a standard approach to the two different things that are fighting each other in this piece, in the original piano arrangement. And if you just look down here at the original piano score, then you can see that there are these smashing notes down here. This is D at the bottom and E right next to it. And the punctuation here is by A and B flat, so the two lowest notes on the piano smashing away. So the question is how to interpret that when you do not have instruments that have the range of a piano. And you can see my solution here. And that is to have the cellos and double basses divisi snap pizzicato on that same interval. But of course not at that exact same pitch. The low E and D smashing away down at the bottom, that's interpreted by the contrabassoon and tuba right next to each other and timpani playing E and D. Now, of course, I could have put the E and the D right next to each other, but then I would have needed two of the large 32-inch uh, kettles, and I just wanted them to be standard, right? I wanted this to be played by a standard orchestra, and they wouldn't have to go to any trouble except for maybe get somebody to bring their bass trumpet. That pretty much takes care of both of those two sounds, except for notice that the very, very low crashing sound of this snap pits is adorned with bass drum, uh, side drum, four horns in F clashing together on pitches in concert pitch of A and B flat, and then the bassoons and bass clarinet doing the same thing. So I didn't have that approach every single time those elements were at play in the piano score, but I did incorporate them into a lot of 
the following arrangement from place to place. You can see them cropping up here and there. Now the melody starts to emerge here. And I scored that for trombones and octaves, a two trombones on top, and then bass trombone on the bottom. And trombones are so big that they didn't really need any help. You can see that this arrangement is actually extremely simple. Now that I've explained my approach to each of those different percussive elements in the piano, you know, the low A and B flat squashed together and the E and D being sort of pinched at the bottom there, then you can see that it, basically that's just the entire approach. And it's very, very simple. And I've just put in the trombones and octaves you know, the funny thing about this is this is actually a pretty good balance. Bass trombone on those lower pitches is pretty beefy. And our two trombones at the top don't necessarily overbalance the top because they form this really cool sonority uh, of double heavy brass. So this actually works out pretty good. I don't have to have a second bass trombone on the bottom there in order to, for this to be playing in a balanced way. And of course, like I'm not going up to like triple F or quadruple F. If I did, then I think I would want more weight on the bottom there, like put the tuba um, alongside this to get a balance. But this is just a light forte uh, with a lot of staccato, a lot of rests in between the tenuto notes. And then of course, it immediately goes down to mezzo forte here. So there really isn't any need for me to overdo it, right? Okay, so after bump, 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 bum, the next octave emerges, right? An octave higher, same kind of idea. Dun, 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 bum, 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 bum. Okay, all that fun stuff. So you'll see that I have put that new episode an octave higher in the C trumpet and bass trumpet. They're taking over the same exact way that the trombones and bass trombone did over here. We've got that same exact relationship. Only with this, I have decided to add a little more weight in the winds. So you've got a two clarinets doubling the bass trumpet part and English horn doubling the trumpets on top. And I feel that this is really beautifully balanced the two clarinets doubling the bass trombone and the two C trumpets being doubled by the English horn. And it will give a very warm, slightly woody feel to the uh, sound of the heavy brass, which will dominate here. And while that is going on, I've taken a harmonic element here of the octave E's this F sharp, written F sharp, is an E, right? In the bass clarinet, and it's sounding down a ninth, so it's the same note as this top bassoon note. And then this low bassoon E is the same as this contrabassoon note here. So this is just basically a doubled octave in the lower winds. Okay, so I've taken that element, and I've added it to the score, and that is because there is a held E going on all the way through here. And I feel that that really does give a little bit of background padding to what's going on in the melody and the percussive elements. Now notice I've also changed the timpani as well. If you remember the settings I had at the beginning, it's low E, B flat in the middle lower staff, D in the middle of the staff, and then E right above that D. And you can see that that is really useful in interpreting what's going on in the piano, right? I can get those E and D uh, seconds right down here, and they don't have to be on pitch. And actually, just to take a tiny bit of time out here to talk about that, that was the other guideline, uh, was just a suggestion. Look, you do not have to have everything at the same pitch as the piano part you can move it around. And I think I said something like, well, I certainly didn't do that 
myself in my orchestration. You can see here that that is really true. I certainly didn't. But those pitches are doubled an octave lower by pizzicato, cellos, and double basses. And you know, notice that, that I can use them not only to underline this sort of crunching note here, which is coming back from time to time, but is not really, uh, doesn't need to have the same approach at all times. So that means that I can use the pizzicato, uh, standard pizzicato, cellos and double basses to bring a new flavor into that constantly pounding rhythm. Then it also provides more balanced interplay between the trumpets and bass trumpet and the percussive element, right? Because if it was too low, then it really would be like bum 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 bum. But here it's bum 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 bum. It's not that far apart in terms of pitch. So that also keeps this from being too gluggy, right? So that was my approach to that particular problem. Now, I really like this part right in here. Bum, 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 bum. And that gave me a chance to interpret those rhythmic elements in new ways as well, bringing in the tuba and the contrabassoon to team up with the cellos, this time divisi, pizzicato with accents, and double basses hopefully able to play these on their C string or with their C extension. If not, they'll just take it up an octave to double the cellos, and that'll sound fine too. And, of course, going back to that E and D. Now, a little bit of advice here, and that is, I really recommend against scoring timpani in harmonic intervals unless you really know what you're doing, unless it really, really fits what's happening in the music because you've got to understand that unless the music is really soft and you can really hear the subtlety of what's going on with the timpani strokes then it's hard to make out the actual difference in pitch between those two notes i'm noticing with some post-romantic composers is that they might score things with a perfect fourth where the idea is that the bottom note down a perfect fourth, let's say that this was E and A, the E would support the A in terms of its overtones. So it's just like making a bigger, beefier sound, right? And that's actually what I've done here as well. But the point is that however you score it, there really will be one pitch that the ear can pick out in terms of the audience unless you're playing very, very softly. So these doublings are really meant to support other harmonic elements in the rhythmic interplay, right? Like these pizzicato notes down here, for instance, will have more support, but they are not necessarily... Um, but you're not necessarily hearing those exact pitches coming from the timpani. It's just that they are in other instruments, so um, so that the ear will be able to make sense of it. And it, it is kind of hard for the timpanist to play two separate pitches and then play two other separate pitches. It is possible, though, but it's something you shouldn't just throw around all over the place because the part just becomes unplayable after a while if you overdo it. Okay, so now moving on to the next part from the double bar, which I put in myself just to divide up where the semi-brev level scoring could proceed from for the Patreon entries. And now we're getting into something different. And that is this cool little idea of expressing the melody in seconds and that is really, really cool, and it has just a sort of a very flighty feel to me. And the approach that I took to interpret that was to just really have some freedom to where the pitches were going to be. And I felt that this is a place where the winds should make their own entrance as a group. 
and express some of that sense of wonderful folk freedom that you hear in so many of Bartok's works. And I feel that that's what I was trying to get here. I don't know if I accomplished that, but I'm pretty happy with the way that this worked out. Notice how those seconds are realized throughout the section, right? So you've got the F sharp on top here, and then the E right below it in the first flute. And then you've got F sharp here in the flute supporting that at the octave. And then E and F sharp stuck together in the oboe. And of course, this is pitch of E down a fifth from the written note, right? So all that forms like a just sonically very, very interesting uh, stack of notes. And notice that I vary it from time to time to put this E right underneath the B of the flute here and open up the texture of, of the harmony right here. And meanwhile below, we have got the strings playing pizzicato and notice that I keep the strings away from the weight of where the winds are here and just allow the winds to play their staccato and accents and tenudos above the pizzicato without the pizzicato really doubling at pitch. That also helps to lighten what the winds are doing without making them feel too pointy, right? They have a kind of more absurd quality than a really ferocious quality. And then on the bottom, the bassoons and contrabassoon are sort of rattling along, chugging along, just as they are here with the left hand. It's almost a note-for-note -note transcription of what the left hand is doing. And I like the way that this becomes more legato, and I have interpreted that in the bassoons here. And then just the way everything kind of slides down. This was actually my favorite part here, was turning this into descending solos, soli, with the winds, and I felt it did not take anything away. Here is where I could use the legato quality of the bassoons, which just add more interesting weight, along with the arco of the first and second violins, and of course the cellos, still punctuated by a little bit of double bass pizzicato, to support the diminishing of weight in the winds. So notice that if we've got all of these players just chugging along here, uh, six players at once, and the texture lightens a little bit because I'm just having featured winds soli climbing down, then it really does help to have the bassoons playing legato along with the uh, cellos. I think that that really does add a lot. And of course, the upper strings here are providing at pitch from the original transcription, at pitch support to what's going on with the flutes and oboes. In this case, I have done the same trick that I did, which is to invert the seconds into sevenths. I think that's a really good approach to take when you are orchestrally transcribing major and minor seconds, is that you can invert them, as I've done here, and it doesn't take anything away. In fact, it, it adds a really beautiful sound, I feel. And it sounds a lot better up there, I feel, than just putting the seconds right next to each other for that kind of lyrical passage. You notice that I've taken the same exact approach here. So there's uh, written, um, written G is C below the staff and B flat above. Okay, now when I get to the clarinets, though, I go back to seconds rather than sevenths, because I'm setting up this lower return of more ferocious elements in percussion and brass. And I really like the stompy thing that I did here. Coming back to the whole idea of snap pizzicato, when you hear a transcription of the A and B flat at the bottom of the piano. So that comes back, bass comes back, snare comes back, and I've even added the violins there to sort of snap around. And then timpani provides sort of the counterweight of 
the bottom of these octave seconds. So boom, snap, boom, snap, boom, and, right? I just feel that that's really kind of a powerful way of taking care of it. And then, of course, just doubling all of that with bass trumpet, trombones, and bass trombone. Here you see how the bass trumpet can really be used as a top voice for the trombones. And it's a, an important role for the bass trumpet from time to time, as I've seen it scored and am scoring it now. And then, of course, horns coming back and tromping around in a similar way to how they did at the beginning of the piece. And then these elements as well for those very, very low minor seconds. All right, continuing on, now we're getting up to rehearsal mark B, from which the Brev level patrons are going to be continuing to score. And here we get into some more traditionally melodic elements, octaves uh, being played in just, you know, a nice legato line. And this is really the first time in the piano part that things have gotten quite that high. You may ask yourself whether or not I've spoiled things by having the winds come in here a little earlier, but I, I feel that that is beside the point, really, myself. Whatever you do, moment to moment, sets up the next thing if you do it right. So in this case, what I elected to do with my transcription is to adapt it to a more orchestrally dynamic kind of flow, which was to have imitation built right into it and a bit of a, you know, a bit of a canon, just things coming in a little bit later and, and playing right off the edge of the last phrase. So I could have this really wonderful trading off between the two lower string parts doubling that with contrabassoon and bass clarinet, which is all the weight that they need there. Now, did you notice that I have a harmonic element in the background, and that is the horns? And piano is the dynamic that they need to be for an actual orchestral performance. Probably, in terms of this mock-up, I could have dropped it down to pianissimo, because um, it's it's not a realistic way that horns would play softly in conjunction with the other elements here. Notice I threw in on these very, very high pitches some doubling from below by first violins in artificial harmonics. And I feel that that supports that top line very, very well without it becoming too shrieky. It's sort of bell-like rather than being squeaky. Then the doubling is also very, very simple of first flute and first clarinet in a unison octave and English horn <laughs> and piccolo three octaves apart, right? Because this is G below middle C and then up an octave from that is, is concert G in the staff, concert G above that, and then an octave higher. And what was really cool here was I caught the piccolo right at the peak of where the English horn's overtones are, right? So that was just a little sonic trickery that I felt was a good opportunity here. Notice that I could have had the oboes do the same thing like an octave higher and possibly reinforced it that way too, kind of getting the middle of the overtones of the oboe, but I felt that this was just going to be a fun way to do it and maybe the only chance I'll ever get to use that creatively. So with all of these elements working together, I was able to bring in snare drum. And this is a little bit of a preview of development of rhythm that you will see coming up in this next page. So I'm giving just a slight taste of it, just, you know, following the natural rhythmic structure that is being laid down by the left hand of the piano. Right? It's not really doing anything too crazy yet. Throwing in the occasional low note, this low E in the timpani, at the same moment as this E here. And I feel that that really does help to punctuate each of these phrases, this A here and that E there. Right, It sort of like helps to start off that phrase. But not to overdo it, 
with pipes and drums, right? That's what I'm taking Bartok at his word, how he envisions this, this sound of this. And there have to be pipes. The pipes don't have to be like huge church pipes, right? They don't have to be alpen horns. They could be just little folk pipes, right? And that's what I am trying to evoke right here. Okay, once again, just the same way that this passage is punctuated by lower elements, I come in with this too. It is just, just following what Bartok is doing in his part. So that low thing gets the snap pits, the bass drum, the snare, and the horns and lower winds. And then I, I feel that this is really cool. Da -da on the C trumpets and the trombones realizing this line here. Now, as this is about to start, I set it up rhythmically. Ba -da -dum, da -da -dum, because I just really want the expectation here from the listener that something really huge is about to happen, and it does, right? I pay that off. I pay off that expectation here. I'll just leave the screen here like this because there's no piccolo right there. <clears throat> so this is all just pretty standard doubling. Like we've got the first violin being doubled by the flutes, ah two, and then oboes, ah two, doubling the second violins, uh, bass clarinet, doubling the violas. Actually, that's not the most standard thing, but it is a good combination. I could have put in clarinets too, but I wanted that hollower sound. And then double basses being doubled by the contrabassoon. Notice that I didn't bother putting in the bassoons below doubling the cellos. I think it's strong enough there. I don't want to overdo it. I want to leave a little bit of space here for the interplay of these percussive elements. Now there is nothing in there is nothing in the piano score that really suggests this all that much. There's just a little hint of it here and there. But mainly, this is my addition, and that is to have these elements kind of bounce off of each other and just add a lot of excitement in there. And I th feel that that is the orchestrator's responsibility, is to bring more into the score. I feel that if Bartok had interpreted this, you know, probably way better than what I'm able to do, but he might have come up with similar strategies. So... I feel that this works really, really well, and it and actually is kind of a really good answer to what happened before, you know, with pipes, with drums, <laughs> right? And the violins add just this wonderful, picturesque quality to it, almost as if you are backing off and you're circling over the drummers and looking at them all hanging out together and having a blast smashing away at their more primitive percussion instruments and you can see a vista of dark green hills or mountains around them uh, up in their sort of high place where they are partying and having this really great musical adventure. A little bit like that idealized vision of more primitive peoples and more more um, folk cultures that we saw when we studied the Stravinsky uh, Rite of Spring series. Let's check out the way that this ends now. So in the piano part, it doesn't really look like it's doing much but just kind of slowly dwindling down and then suddenly swelling at the end and adding some stomping. So here is how I chose to interpret that. And that is coming back with the whole idea of pipes uh, and making this a stronger kind of passage rather than just sort of burbling down, right? I wanted it to lead to this ending in a strong way. So with that in mind, we've got clarinet and piccolo at octaves apart. And I feel that that is also a very, very bright, uh, very cutting sound. And from below, we've got the C trumpet, so it's a triple octave. 
and the overtones stack just really piercingly here. I feel that, you know, like when they talk about the piccolo being piercing, I feel that this would feel not really unpleasant to the ear, but it would definitely be felt in the inner cavities of the ear, you know, slightly more on the attack. And the counterpoint here, uh, lower heavy brass, taking those lines and just interpreting them, not legato, but more bouncing. And it's kind of easier to hear a line like this when there is staccato involved, there's separation between the elements, as opposed to legato. I do use legato in the lower heavy brass uh, later on in the piece, but you know, for right here, I feel that this kind of bounce works really well. And then the sort of da-da, da-da, ba-bum. Now I threw in da-da-dum, ba-da-dum. I threw in these 16th notes as a way of just really building the energy towards this point right in here. Okay, and then bringing in the strings gradually, right? Notice that they don't have to be doubled on every single pitch everywhere, right? It's enough here that they are um, they're coming in with the horns and trumpets, and then as they stack, bring in the piccolo and flute, oboes, and so on, clarinets, and then just jumping up an octave right here, and then having this big crash at the end, okay, with that low stompy note once again. So this kind of, for me, brings all of the elements together that have been building throughout. Of course, you've got You've got the the continuing strings. You've got the big stompy uh, bass note right at the beginning with snap pits. Notice, not necessarily on the same pitches as before. A big heavy stroke on the bass drum, and so on. So it it it's a it's a really great way of like contrasting those two opposing forces that are kind of they're kind of playing off of one another as the music progresses okay so now we're getting in towards the really really exciting really frantic ending and this was actually a bit difficult for me I mean I had a pretty strong notion of what I was going to do here but if you look at the piano part there's really it's really becoming more and more percussive and less and less properly melodic. Uh, and especially if I amp up the energy here with uh, Cello Rondo up to 144, I have to just be really careful of what I'm doing. So I felt like this was the most treacherous section. Let's just um, bring up the score size here a little bit. All right, <clears throat> so now you can see everything at a larger size, and there is like no upper winds right in there. Okay, so very simple pizzicato approach here, I feel, but very much in keeping with Bartok. And then this little phrase here, I felt was a great opportunity to do one of those little Bartok things, where he just like has this one little bit of legato in the midst of a bunch of jumping around uh, more pizzicato type of approach and I felt that it really stood out nicely the bassoons doubling the viola and cello right here with a lot of weight and that will work in concert pretty well and notice that the timpani are going back to really just like you know d and e seconds above and e below just kind of going back and forth between them sometimes like this sometimes like this in a stack depending on what the music is doing. And the clarinet's making a really good combination with uh, pizzicato violins and cellos and so on. And then as things become more and more kind of grindy and just really kind of starting to bring in those stomping elements, changing over to more aggressive lower winds, horns once again, uh, bringing in some counterpoint to that. This this whole snap pits idea, I had to divide the double basses here, as you see. So some of them are doubling the cellos at an octave, and some of them are doing snap pizzicato. I'm assuming a standard 
complement of strings here, so probably like eight string bases. So if this is played divisi here, which I forgot to write in, sorry. So if you have two double bases doing a snap pizzicato on an A and two of them on a B flat, then that should be enough because this is just really meant to be kind of fast um, and and agile rather than necessarily really big and stompy like the beginning. Uh, and of course, that's all supported with those same elements as before, bass drum and uh, horns playing a uh, concert A and a concert B flat. And uh, same thing with the bassoons. I don't bother with the bass clarinet because I want it doubling the lower strings. And I'm getting a lot of back and forth here between a bass drum and tenor drum. I could have, there's a little bit more tenor drum I could have talked about before, but this is good enough for right in here. And then really nice uh, opportunity for the tuba to do some doubling as well with the lower strings, the double bass in particular. And then I really liked what happened here in the piano part where there is a melodic element starting to emerge and then a bit of a duo here, a little bit of lower counterpoint happening. And I brought in those elements by having the tuba here play the lower line and that being doubled by the cellos and double basses in unison but then dropping the octave as the part gets more intense and then at this point having that as well being played by contrabassoon so I feel it just gives a sudden flush of weight as the lower line goes towards that bottom C sharp and meanwhile above you can't go wrong with staccato trombones and, and bass trombone at this point because it really does allow the ear to hear both. I think that if I had made this top line legato that it would just be impossible to make out what was going on here. It would just be too muddy. Notice that I divided this into shorter groups of slurs so that I could punch here at the end quite naturally, as opposed to this huge line that uh, Bartok just puts over the entire section. I feel that you don't really get that staccatissimo note here very well, unless you realize it in a different way with your instruments. That also feeds into the articulation of the upper line in bass trombone and two tenor trombones. And while all of this is going on, of course, that same kind of punchy... Uh, offbeat of the bass drums te teamed up with snap pizzicato is just punching through, you know, along with the horns and bassoons. So I feel that that has all the energy that it needs. And of course, using the tenor drum is a good alternate to the snare so that the snare sound does not just take over your brain. I scored this so that the snare drum and the tenor drum could be played by one percussionist and they could just move back and forth, you know, between the two drums on stands right next to each other. So, you know, I don't know, it would be great if this arrangement did get performed. That would be a dream come true for me. Okay, and now it's really getting into polka stringendo, and the part is just amping up in terms of energy. This is a little bit of a cheat that I'd like to recommend to people who would you just want to put a poco poco crescendo at the beginning of a phrase and have the playback realize that without having to put in a big dashed line. Those big dashed lines that you see, you know, poco poco crescendo, and then you tell the player exactly how long that's going to be, and then you say in this case it ends right here. Those dashed lines are really a bother for people who are looking at parts on stands. Okay? For a pianist who is reading things at a larger staff size and is used to a certain approach, they're fine. But for your average concert player, a dashed line can just look confusing. It can look like uh, an extra staff line, right? So you want to avoid that. So they know what the meaning is. If they see it at the beginning of a phrase, until they get a dynamic marking, like this, in this case, fortissimo, or sforz fortissimo, then they will just say, okay, I start here and I get louder and then I end up here. They don't need the dashed line. 
but you might still want to hear that crescendo in your playback. So basically, put in a invisible crescendo line, and you know, the way that you do that, just make the crescendo line, select it, and then go Shift-Command-H or Shift-Control-H, and it will hide it. Okay, so a lot of these elements, kind of the same as before, the whole bass drum idea with that low chugging thing, and then the pizzicato cellos and a divisi double basses, taking care of the E and the D stuck together, so a transcription of that. And I felt that right here, it's just a just fun to just bounce back and forth between those elements. However, this is coming along. Bum, 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 bum. And it's being previewed here by this. Bum, 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 and so on. That is just being handled by the heavy brass here, bass trumpet, trombones, and bass trombone. And then here, they start to leap up. Bum, 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 and so on. And I feel that that's pretty easy scoring myself. I mean, I, th I feel it's kind of obvious. Explaining it is, you know, not even worth it. I think I forgot to write in here whether this would be A2 or like just the first, but I would say probably just the first or second trumpet player coming in here. And then here, as things start to leap up, I just made more dramatic decisions as to how I was going to interpret this. I really wanted the full weight of the orchestra to hit right there. Okay. And I even threw in this little rip. So, yeah, maybe this is a bit obvious of an obvious thing to do, but I felt that the power of the heavy brass is so intense that by the time this starts to come in and add its element, it just is a natural progression, right? It doesn't, the jump from here to there is really not that big in terms of dynamics or drama if these players are just really chugging along and just really, you know, giving everything they can to their part. By the time you get to here, I think that it just fits in exactly right where it needs to be. Okay, so yeah, it's just very basic doubling, you know, that high E up there is being played by the piccolo, and then, then the one below it by the second violins, and oboes, and this is actually a very easy rip for the oboes, just A to A, ripping up to E, that's no big deal. An English horn is playing that low E, same note as the trombone here, and yeah, it, it's it's all pretty basic. But notice that I still throw in the same, you know, the same approach that I'm taking to the bass drum note, you know, with the snap pizzicato that is also incorporated into this, so that it really just has that firm ending boom. Okay, so now this was one of my favorite areas of the entire piece was the ending. So you notice that I just really had a different approach to it than might be suggested by the piano. That is if you're just looking at the notes of the piano, right? So here you've got the octave melody, you got this little bip right in there, and then it does its little climb and then descent. And then as it's holding, there's one last little stomp, and then everything comes to an end. Okay. Now, to a piano player, though, like if you're actually just thinking of what is the sound happening in the piano... When you hit this little last little note here, um, what what is happening after you hit this note is just kind of less and less of a sound of the sustained F octave, and you're just hearing more and more of the strange little overtones, and this excites them, right? So that is exactly what's happening here. You have one last little stomp, but the other players are just coming in right out of the bottom of that with this lovely little kind of overtone idea. These are idealized, by the way. This is not the exact scientific sound of what the overtones of a piano would be like if you just um, were holding F octaves and you threw in, like, rock bottom A and B flat. You know, what would that excite in the overtones of that F? I'm just imagining it here. 
by adding a sort of an alien sound with the piccolo and um, and flutes being doubled by these artificial harmonics in the upper strings. Okay, so it's and and then just a little bit of padding in there by the heavy brass and clarinet. So that is just my imagination. That is not a scientific approach. Okay. Um, another thing I wanted to point out about the problem with playback is that is the Sibelius playback engine and note performer really don't do forte piano very well. So you notice that I've actually notated this out uh, to have that heavy stroke and then just followed immediately by pianissimo crescendoing to fortissimo. If I were preparing this for an actual orchestra and conductor, I would just write in, you know, FFPP right on this and then and have it as just one note. But the playback engine doesn't understand that, right? So I've actually taken the liberty of just notating it out um, exactly the way that it would sound as two separate notes. So anyway, apologies about that, but that's just the limitations of the of the beast. Okay, and I also played around a bit with the uh, tempo a bit, just to kind of... I mean, it's something that the pianists would do themselves a little bit, just to kind of make a bigger emotional point going towards the end of the piece. So those are elements that I brought in, just to keep it from being boring at the end, and just, you know, I mean... I don't think that this is boring, but I think that adding orchestral drama to it is just paramount here. You have to put in everything that you can to leave the audience amazed instead of just, oh, that was kind of an inter interesting ending to a very dramatic piece. Rather than that, they'll say, wow, that was a really dramatic ending to a dramatic piece, right? So to add these big octaves here with the upper strings and upper winds and heavy brass. I feel that that's just really a scorching octave there. Notice that I compromise here by dropping down to this low E flat because that, you know, if we were to really follow that all the way up to that high E flat, that just is really not much of a note on actual flutes, right? So I just drop down an octave there and it doesn't really matter because the, this piccolo is going to shine through, especially with doubling from the first violins. So this is all pretty well balanced. And one last little chance for the bass trumpet to shine, I feel. And it's just real exciting the way this all comes together. And I really love forte piano crescendo, or in this case, fortissimo pianissimo crescendo. It's just really, really fun to do. And then just it to end with a bite Right, and that bite is that same old friend of ours, right? It's the bass clarinets plus bassoon, contra bassoon added in this time, the uh, horns in minor seconds, and uh, adding trombones and tuba, timpani as well, and bass drum and the snap pizzicato uh, to interpret that low minor second. So that is how. I orchestrated this piece, and I hope you enjoy that. It was really, really fun for me to orchestrate, and I hope that by the time I release this video publicly, I've had a chance to look at a few dozen scores, and that the entrants have had a lot of fun doing their own scoring as well, and that this new version, using the website and Patreon to get around a couple of problems to do with copyright and so on, and to sort of reboot that part of the community, the website. I hope that that's all been successful. Um, just speaking about that website, the orchestrationonline.com website, is a lot of people ask questions in the Facebook group, the answer to which I have answered in detail. <laughs> Uh, on the website. So I'm hoping that this will bring more people over to the website so they can see the resources there and access to other resources that other people out there who love orchestration have provided and see that more of a hub rather than just dropping into Facebook and asking a random question about something that, you know, 
is answered in any orchestration manual or answered on the website or answered by another blogger like Tim Davies uh, or Brett Newton. You know, there, there are some really, really great resources out there and, and different perspectives, different points of view on what could be done. Um, before you even ask a question on Facebook. Not that I'm discouraging that. I think it's great that people have conversations about even simple questions. And with that, I will just leave the rest of it to you. If you haven't yet participated in this challenge and you kind of missed your chance, well, just maybe wait till the next one. I, I can't give any more feedback than I already have up to the point where the challenge closed right when I released this video. But I'm hoping to do these every year. I think that would be really, really great. So I'll be looking for something that's just equally surprising and dramatic and fun as this work and the work before it, the Ravel Waltz in the Manor of Borodine. So thanks once again. Thanks everybody for entering into this challenge. And thank you for spending the time with me to look at the orchestration for my challenge and why I made the decisions that I did. And I will be seeing you soon with more videos about orchestration. <laughs>